But when I received my letter, I knew that I was actually going to cross the river and uh, I was not going to come back. Mm -hmm. Alex for the introduction earlier. It's very generous of you, and uh, it's very lovely to be able to do this evening with you. Actually, um, so this evening I'm gonna try. I'm, I'm saying I'm gonna try because uh, I don't think it's really easy to talk about prana. Um, so I'm gonna try to make an attempt to talk about prana. Uh, I don't think I'm necessarily the most adequate person to talk about prana myself, and it's the first time I'm actually talking about it. Um, and you know, it might be that at a time you don't really understand what I'm talking about, and you might just <laughs> raise your hand if you if you don't if you don't understand at time is you know it's fine. You can maybe stop me, and we can stop and unpack things a bit more together. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it in the context of the five spiritual faculties. So you mentioned earlier that those five spiritual faculties are faith, uh, vigor, energy in the pursuit of the good, uh, mindfulness, concentration, and then prana, wisdom. And these are the quality of the enlightened man, mind and also the quality that we have to sort of try to practice in order to follow the path of enlightenment. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain at the end. I'm going to try to tie them up at the end of the talk. And I think it would make more sense why those five spiritual faculties are presented as a model together. Yeah. Um, and mainly what I want to talk about, um, I want to try to explain prana in terms of love. So prana, uh, we translate it as wisdom, uh, but it's not a wisdom of uh, factual, factual knowledge. Uh, it's not a wisdom of book knowledge and all that. It's not that. Uh, I think it's a wisdom as seeing things as well. When we see through rea reality, when we wake up to, uh, to the reality of things, what happens is love arises. So I think prana in a way, uh, there's many ways we can talk about it, but I think it always comes back to uh, how to love. And the love that I'm gonna talk about is not a romantic love. Uh, it's uh, it's the great love, yeah, it's a unconditional love, yeah. Uh, Joel Coltrane in his album, Love Supreme, he called, you know, it's a supreme love in a way, yeah. Before I do that, and uh, I think I have to do that because um, in a way, well, when we when we when we're trying to stand here, we're trying to share some of our experience, and uh, I think I can't quite come up and talk give a talk tonight if I'm not actually sharing what happened today in my day, because that feels very significant, and uh, I feel like I sort of have to do that, and I want to do that before starting the talk. But on Monday, uh, the day before yesterday, I received an email from a friend from my community in Bethnal Green saying that. Uh, a young man, of, a young, actually an adolescent of 17 years old, was stabbed to death uh, just next to where I live. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know the, I don't know the young man, uh, but I went there today in the scene, and uh, I wanted to basically pay my respect, actually, uh, and give flowers, lay flowers, and give a card on behalf of my community. And uh, I went there, and uh, I have to say, it was a bit of a shock. I found, I found that very uh, difficult. Um, there's lots of flowers. There's the name of the young man. His, na his name is Shia. And uh, there was his two little brothers uh, that were there. Um, and, uh, and I met the family uh, um, who, who, who were there as well. And uh, anyway, I felt, I felt really moved by that because I felt that, um, well, a, a life has, has been taken and, you know, uh, too young to die in a way, too young to die. Um, for no reason, probably, for no valid reason. Uh, I don't think there's any valid reason to kill someone personally. And uh, there's this two little boy, one of them called Theo and one of them called Zach, standing there. You know, uh, the mom was there. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, the other boy that uh, killed him, uh, uh, I felt for him as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, what a life. What a life. Imagine if you're in your, you know, your early early life and uh, that's what you do you know it's like you know there's no life after that you know um, anyway so I think I think somehow what I'm going to talk about it's really important it's really really important because we need we need that sort of wisdom to wake up to how things are to be able to love and, and really avoid this sort of um, these sort of things actually yeah so I just want I just wanted to bring that in uh, and share that with you because it's been quite an emotional day for me um, and you know I don't want to dramatize 
the whole thing but there's you know blood on the floor you know and all that and anyway so um i won't talk about prania as well in the context of the life story of the buddha uh so what i'm going to do is i'm gonna actually tell bring out zoom out and few important points of the life story of the buddha and uh, show you how prania uh, well how to sort of point out prania in the context of the life story of the buddha yeah so the Buddha, when he was a young man, his name was Siddhartha Gautama. Yeah, he was living in India in uh, what we call now Lumbini. Uh, it's a region of North India, and uh, he spent a life, his early early life, uh, being very sheltered and very loved. So his dad was actually uh, a king, and uh, a king that sort of owned the kingdom of where they were, where they were living in the in the region of Lumbini. And um, there was a prophecy, apparently his dad, when he was young, saw a medium uh, with his son, Siddhartha Gautama. And apparently the medium saw Siddhartha and said to the king, he said, either your son, when he will grow up, uh, he will either become a great king or he will become a great sage, a holy man. Yeah? And the great king was um, happy and sad. And, uh, one of the things that it was sure is that the great king didn't want his son to be a, a, a holy man, but definitely wanted his son to be a, to be a king and take on his leg legacy and, and rule rule that region that was uh, there at the time. So his strategy to do that was to shelter his son and to give him anything that he wanted to. Obviously, he had all the wealth that he could do to do that, and so uh, you know until quite quite. Yeah, well, maybe around his late twenties, Siddhartha Gautama was always living in luxury, complete luxury, uh, with people doing all sorts of things for him. He had different palaces, uh, one palace for the summer, one palace for the winter, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, could do whatever he wanted to, but yet was very, very sheltered. And uh, he reached an age where he was in his late twenties, so I'm fast forwarding a little bit, um, where he had a wife, still lived the shelter life, still didn't see the world. And, um, and he had a son and at some point he reached an age and uh, he felt a strong sense of dissatisfaction. Yeah. And, uh, and he felt that there was something more, something more than that life of, of pleasure. Of course there was meaning with his wife and his son and all that, but he just felt that there must be, there must be something more to life. And one day, uh, the myth, the story say that uh, he goes and he goes out of the palace and uh, what he sees, so he's, he goes in town for the first time and what he sees is he see a sick man for the first time and, uh, and he doesn't understand, he doesn't understand, he says, well, wh what is that? And uh, he's with one of his servants and he asks his servant, that, that son said, well, that's just a sick man, you know, and uh, you know, that's what people do and you will get sick and he couldn't, you know, that was a big blow, you know, for him. It's a big setback in a way. He's never got sick, very good health, sort of vanity of youth. And uh, he just thought, well, that's, you know, fair enough, but why, you know, what's going on here? Went back, was quite puzzled by that. And then again, went in town the day after, let's say. And, uh, and then uh, he saw a sick, uh, no, a sick man, he saw an old man, yeah, old man, never saw an old man before. All the people that he saw before were young, uh, pretty, you could say, in good health, in good nick. And, uh, and there it was a very elderly man, frail man, you know, just by the, by the street on the pavement. And, uh, and he's completely shocked again. He's like, what is that? It's, you know, you get that sometime when you see something you've never seen before, you know, a new creature or something. And, you want to wise that and then his servant his friend said well that's just an old man and he asked well what is that and he said well you, when, when you age that that's what happens and again he's completely surprised and he's like oh what's going on there and anyway he goes back and and you know he goes again and you know that sort of it start i think it start to like it kick start the process in his mind of like waking up to life waking up to the facts of life you know that he wasn't aware before and after that, uh, another night, he goes out and what he sees, uh, he sees a dead man, yeah? And, uh, and again, he doesn't understand what's a dead person. And, uh, and then he asks his friend and his friend says, well, that's, that's what happens, you know, in, 
when you get old, uh, you can get sick and you can die, or you can even die, you know, just any time really. And uh, and that's the that's the last blow, you know, for him, is when I think he's waking up to the fact that, you know, life is impermanent and things are not lasting. Yeah. And what happens is during the same night, he also sees a holy man, and he has what we call the f what in Buddhism we call that we call that the four sides. So he sees someone that doesn't sort of seek out pleasure, but trying to live a noble life, uh, which is a life with virtue and meditation. And he sees that, and he has, in a way, sees things that really upset him, uh, and at the same time, he sees that there's actually a light at the end of the tunnel, you know? And he comes back to the palace, and from that point onwards, something has changed. Yeah, something has changed in him that he knows that he can't go back anymore. He can't go on to live the life that he was living before. Yeah. So I don't know if that happened to you, but um, it happened to me. It happened to me where uh, at different stages of my life, I experienced things. Of course, I was aware of, of, of death and sickness and all that. I was not sheltered at the, as the Buddha, but, but yet sometimes it doesn't go very deep, you know. And I experienced things in my life where I felt like I couldn't go back to the same life that I was living anymore. Yeah, um, I think th there's few moments, but one of them, and I talked about it on Monday, one of them was realizing the fact of death when I was 10 years old. Um, I suddenly realized that I was not immortal, that I was going to die one day, and that completely shocked me. Yeah, in fact, I had vertigo for two weeks. I, I was in panic, and you know, um, I couldn't sleep. And at the same time, it sort of made meaning into my life because it meant that, okay, if I'm going to die, then what am I going to, what am I going to do with my life? And I felt that I really grew up from that time. There's another time where in my 20s, uh, I was in a relationship that was going sort of well. Uh, I was maybe in love, maybe not that in love, but you know, I just felt like you know, um, that was gonna stay and last forever in my mind. Uh, we used to live together and uh, you could say in my mind she was the one, whatever. And uh, she left me. <laughs> she left me and uh, I, I remember that, that that was a death. It was an absolutely death because for three years, you know, I sort of merged with another human being and that gave me a sense of security. And you plan your life in a certain way and one day you realize that's just not going to happen whether you want it or not, it's not going to happen. And I was just, again, I think I was really shocked because when the news came to me, I didn't believe it. I just thought, well, she's just having a little bit of a crisis and I just need to wait to come back. You know, I was like, there's no way she's going to leave me. No way. She didn't. <laughs> she didn't come back. <laughs> and that was very painful. It was very, she actually left me for someone else. So it was, you know, when I found that out, I knew there was no going back. And that was a death. It was a real death. And I know after that, again, I couldn't live my life in the way that I was living before. There's another instance with my family. I can't go on too long in that story, but there was another instance with my family uh, where I had a bit of a news. And uh, it was a complete shock. Complete shock. And uh, again, I just... Basically, I just realized that the everything that gave me security in my life, you know, and which I think was, was stable and that would never sort of um, change, changed and changed forever. And um, yeah, from, from that time, I, I, I knew that, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't live my life in the way that uh, I was living it anymore. And I think the Buddha, in a way, the Buddha um, felt that. He felt that, okay, well, he's going to die. He's going to get sick, maybe. Uh, he's going to get old, maybe, but he's definitely going to die. Uh, and what is that? Why is life about if we are going to die? You know. And uh, for him, at that point, he decided that he wanted to solve the. You could, you could say, you could summarize that in a way in which he wanted to solve the problem of suffering. Okay, if we are here, we are going to die. What is life about? Yeah. And he didn't know exactly what he was going to seek out or what he was going to find out. But he said to himself that he was just gonna, he was just gonna try, yeah. And he left. So the story is a very beautiful story, and I'm afraid I don't have enough time to uh, 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 give you all the details. But he left at night, and at night, what he's done is that he 
change his clothes. He had very uh, lofty, beautiful, smart clothes, prince-like clothes, and he actually exchanged his clothes with a beggar. And uh, he was actually wearing ra rags, and he cut his hair. And, uh, and, uh, and at some point, the city uh, uh, stopped at the river, yeah? And from the river was like, um, in a way, the border between the city, city life, and the forest, yeah? And the forest is a, a symbol of going forth, yeah? And, uh, and it's very significant because you've got that river and uh, he's like, he's got his rags, he's got his, in a way, he's got his, well, he lost his hair, he's losing his identity, but then really crossed the river and, uh, and he manages to cross the river. And uh, I think the river is a big symbol. For me, it's a symbol because I feel like in my life, um, I'm close to the river, yeah. Um, you know, next to the city, I keep the city next to me, yeah. And I keep also the forest next, next to me. And uh, I take a dip in the river. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, I go in the forest and sometimes I come back, but I never feel like I fully completely cross the river. And uh, maybe, I don't know if you experienced that as well in your life, when we really feel like, okay, something is calling us. We want to cross the river and yet we can't quite, we can't quite do it. I, I just wanna, I don't, I don't want to make this talk about myself, but I just wanna share you a moment where I felt like for the first time in my life, I actually really cr crossed the river. And that was when I received my letter for ordination. So I got ordained last year uh, in August. Uh, and when you go for ordination, uh, you basically agree to be part of a three month retreat uh, in, uh, in Spain uh, with very basic conditions. And you live basically like a monk with other, other friends, other brothers, who are going to get ordained with you. There's the same thing for women as well. Um, and we go in Spain, we've got two retreat centers in Spain for ordination, one for women and one for, for men. And, um, and what you do is you live like a monk. So you shave your head, you go through this incredible ritual and you go through what we call a spiritual death. Yeah. So you get ordained one night, there's this incredible ritual, uh, which is magical. And then you go into a place what that we call the Kuti, and uh, it's very mysterious and magical. And then you reach to that place, which is like in the forest. I wasn't ordained that place, but usually you get ordained that place. It's just because of lockdown, things are happened differently. But that's what I'm gonna tell you. And, uh, and in a way, it happened in the same way, it's just different location. And when you go into that place, you know that your life will never, will never be the same, yeah? And we call the Kuti, and sometimes people call it the lion cage. Yeah, you're never gonna come back, yeah? <laughs> So you go into the lion cage and uh, you find your pride preceptor and your pride preceptor gives you a new name, a new yidan, and a new practice. And that's where my name was given to me, Pranyagosha, by my pride preceptor, Nyaraja. Yeah. And then you, you, so you've got your head, your head shaved and you go for three months and for three months you have no idea what you're going to do. They don't tell you. They don't tell you the program. And throughout these three months they only give you periods of, you know, they tell you, okay, now for the next week, we're going to have this period, now, you know, and there's one month of complete silence. And anyway, I feel, I knew all that. I didn't know exactly what I was going to, what was going to happen, but I knew, I sort of knew the, the highlights as just what I'm telling you as bad. I knew nothing more than that. But when I received my letter, I knew that I was actually going to cross the river and uh, I was not going to come back. And, uh, and I did that and I left my job. I left everything. In fact, I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to die spiritually in a clean way. So I, I tried to come into terms with, you know, trying to clean, go there with a clean conscience. So I went to all my friends and uh, especially friends that, you know, I felt like, you know, we had something to sort of resolve. Uh, I went to see my ex-girlfriend uh, for the first time after four years and uh, we had a lovely afternoon. And, and things completely resolved and I said to her, look, you know, it's probably the biggest gift you, you gave me actually. And I look at it like that, you know, and she's very good, she's got two kids and I feel very, I feel very um, grateful for her, I feel grateful for this relationship. Anyway, I went forth, yeah, that's the only time I think in my life that I went forth, yeah. Now to go back to the Buddha and cross the river. Um, the Buddha crossed the river and, uh, and was very scared, yeah, he was very scared because he knew he was not going to come back, yeah. And uh, he lived, uh, he went for, lived in the jungle and taught himself, taught himself uh, how to live in the jungle. Uh, the story lasts for about 
uh, six years, I think. And uh, he meets several teachers, uh, becomes sort of uh, becomes better than, than the teachers, overtake the teachers. The teachers say, look, we can be your disciple now if you want. And, you know, you can sort of lead our tradition and all that. But he's not interested. He said, no, I he was reaching these higher states of consciousness, which we call dhyanas and samadhi, which is one of the uh, five of the, sp the fourth or yeah, the fourth of the spiritual faculties. He was reaching these higher states of consciousness, but he felt like, okay, well, there must be something more. There definitely must be something more. So he tried, he tries out different things, and uh, that lasts for quite a long time. And one day he tries, he finds a, he finds a tribes of friends, which in the tradition we call the five as ascetics. And uh, what they do is they practice austerities. Yeah. And that is a quite common thing to practice in India. Uh, I've been to India myself, and you see people practicing austerities. You see people in India like um, sort of lying down and sleeping on, on sort of uh, nails bed, you know, bed with like spikes and things like that, or, or people standing on one, one, just one feet for like hours and hours. One of the things that was the most common thing to do at that time was to fast, and to fast almost to death. And of course, the Buddha was the best of uh, these practitioners. So he was, you know, he was not just stopping where people were. Stop he was going a step further, as it were, doing it, going an extra mile. And one day, he actually, uh, it was just almost going to die. Yeah, he felt, he felt that he was just basically he had like. His skin, you know, was just like touching his bones and he looked there. I mean, he was just about, to, he was actually just about to die. And uh, what happens is that, I, I can't remember the exact sequence, but what happens is that he remembers, he remembers a memory when he was a teenager uh, at the palace where he was learning meditation for the first time. He had a sort of beginner's mind. And uh, it's what we call the rose, the, the moment of the rose apple tree. And you remember that moment sitting just under a tree and experiencing this very pleasure state of consciousness. And you realize that, oh, I got it wrong. I'm just going to die. You know, I'm not going to free myself. I'm just going to die, you know. And, if, and he's got that memory in mind. He's like, oh, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should, I should find a tree and meditate. That's, so that's, that's, the, that's the thing that comes to mind. And at that time, I can't remember exactly the sequence, but I think at that time, there is a young lady that comes and they, she sees Siddhartha and she's like, this guy is going to die. So she gives him a, a bit of um, a, a, what you could call rice pudding. She gives him a bit of rice pudding yeah? and he eats the rice pudding. Yeah? So it, it's funny, the story goes that uh, the ascetics, they see the Buddha and they're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what is he doing? He's eating rice pudding, is he crazy? And they completely reject him. They're like, oh, he's, he's a loser. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yes, yeah, so the Buddha is like, okay, doesn't mind. The Buddha, go, you know, he eats the rice pudding, gets a bit better, and then finds a tree. Yeah, he finds a tree and he says to himself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to find the problem, to solve the problem of suffering here on that tree. Or I'm gonna die trying. Yeah, it was a complete determination. Yeah, no going back again. And he sat down. He sits down, and um, again, the story is like, you know, there's lots of myth. And during the stories, there's a myth of Mara. With personally, I don't think it, it's it's a literal myth. Uh, it's more the myth of the mind of the Buddha. But and Mara, Mara in the Buddhist tradition. Uh, represent in the way uh, the forces of, of evil or forces that stops us from making progress on the path. Yeah. You could, he sort of personifies in a way uh, what we could say in the, in, the, in the Christian tradition, the devil. The devil yeah? So Mara just appears, he appears one night and he's got all his army and he's like, let's just try to attack the Buddha. And the army comes with all sorts of weapons and they're all sorts of like horrible creatures, very scary and all that. And, and what happens is all the weapons, when they reach the Buddha, they turn into flowers yeah, and petals, yeah? which is a very beautiful image, I think. Then Maras tries another strategy and he's got all the uh, beautiful uh, girls uh, and servants and, and all sorts of very attractive people coming and all that. And they come and they say, oh, you know, Siddhartha, why don't you go back to the palace? Let's just enjoy ourselves. You know, let's, let's have a good time. You know? And uh, Siddhartha is not interested. Stays on the stays on the tree, 
And then Maha is, tries his first shot and he goes to the Buddha himself and he says, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to think that actually you're there and you can just sort of like solve the problem of suffering? You know, it's like, who are you? You know, sort of thing. And uh, the Buddha looks at Mara and uh, he says, he says, I'm Siddhartha Gautama and I've got the witness, the, you know, the, I got for witness the earth goddess and he touches the earth. Yeah. And when he touches the earth, something happens, a miracle happens which I can't quite explain, but I'm gonna to try to. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm just gonna share. I don't think we can really explain. I don't think we, I think the sort of thing that happens uh, at, well, the place is called uh, uh, um, Bodh Gaya in India. I've been there myself, absolutely beautiful and divine. What happens there under the Bodhi tree is very mysterious. And uh, we can try to use words, but I think, you know, it's a it's sort of event that goes beyond words in a way. So what happens uh, is that, well, you know, apparently the earth goddess and the whole universe wakes up and they all witness the Buddha. And there's a whole process that lasts for about seven days when the Buddha managed to release uh, his consciousness. Yeah. And uh, sort of maybe you could say turn into a new type of species, an enlightenment mind. Yeah. And uh, in the first, the, what they call that traditionally, uh, it, it happened through sequences, so I'm just going to share that. I don't know if it happens like it, but it happens through sequences. So apparently on the first night, what he saw is that he saw all his life going back and back and back. Yeah. Uh, in Buddhism, we believe in rebirth. So when you die, we believe that if you didn't manage to release, to free your consciousness, you go back and then you you take on a new form, a new life. And he saw his, all, his, all his life, his previous life. Yeah. In the second night, what he saw, and I think now we are in the realm of prania, we are in the realm of the sort of wisdom that I'm going to try to talk about, he saw that actually all phenomena, all phenomena uh, are empty by essence. Yeah. And he realized that basically this delusion, uh, this sense of self that he had, that he has, uh, where he experiences everything as subject and object yeah as as him and myself you know disconnected from everything else uh, was just a delusion and it's actually not true everything on a deeper level of consciousness it's actually all we all connected yeah and this sort of connectedness we, what we call shunyata it's uh, character characterized by a sense of emptiness yeah because all things are empty by essence so his sense of self doesn't exist in the way that he thinks it does. What happens is that he realizes that he's connected with all life. When we feel that, when I realize that me, this sense of self that I think is so fixed and so true, it's actually not. And actually myself and others, um, there's not this thin barriers. What I realize is that we're all connected. And as a result, what happens is compassion and love arises. Yeah, Maitri Karana arises. Yeah, I realize by the fact that actually on a deeper level of mind, on a deeper level of reality, deeper level of consciousness, we're all connected. And that's what happened to him. And because he realized that, he also saw that all human beings, he had like a picture, what we call conditioned co-production, that all human beings, they take on afterlife a new form because of their deeds, because of their karma. Yeah. So I'm going to try to explain that, but I think it's quite difficult to explain, but I'm going to try to do that. So in the Buddhist tradition, we believe that we take on a new form because all our life, we're so sure of this sense of self that we set up our life in a way that we want to be happy for ourselves, that we bolster this sense of self so much that when we die, when the consciousness gets released, uh, we're so not used to that, that we just want to take on a new form, a new body. Yeah. If you manage to see through that uh, delusion, yeah, uh, and you stop because you realize that you don't need to protect that sense of self anymore, then you don't have so much hatred, you don't have so much delusion and ignorance, yeah. What happens is that you live your life in a way that consciousness starts to release itself. You start to thin, thin the, the, the lines between yourself and others. And when you die, you release your consciousness and your consciousness is released to what we call nirvana. Yeah. And um, so he sees that, he sees that all human beings, 
because of greed, hatred and delusion, because they think they have a sense of self that they want to protect because they want to be happy and so on and so forth, because of their actions, karma and so on and so forth, when they die, they come back. He saw that. And because he saw that, not intellectually, but emotionally, completely understood that truth, what happened is he managed to release his consciousness and he got enlightened. And when he got enlightened, he went through a chemical change. Yeah, it was not a change that could, that could go back. And you could say that he, his consciousness was confined in the body, but was not conditioned by it. Yeah. So he, he had a body, he had a body of mind, but at the same time, he could always connect for all life. He was completely aware and completely loving all the time. Yeah. So in a way that ties up with all the five spiritual faculties, because imagine if you, if you leave this room tonight with a sense of freedom from not wanting to protect that sense of self, yeah, what will happen? Well, energy will arise. We spend so much energy trying to protect that self. I think sometimes it's fine to protect that self, but all the time I don't think, I don't think it's fine. And I think actually most of our suffering comes from that, actually. Uh, all the suffering in the world comes from the fact that people want to protect themselves. They want to be happy. They use wrong strategy because they are ignorant and then they cause harm to themselves and others. So imagine we don't do that tonight. We go out and we feel like, oh, I don't need to protect anything anymore. What happened? What arises? Sense of energy arises. Yeah? And then you, you start to be a bit more concentrated and more loving. Yeah? You have more faith. Yeah? More faith in life because you realize that everything is connected. So we start with faith. Then you have energy. And then concentration and also mindfulness. The Buddha apparently was someone who was completely fully aware. He was fully aware in here and now in the present. He had no sort of like rumination about the past or thinking about the future. He was always here and now. Yeah. So you see all these, all these spiritual faculties, they sort of work together. And why is because he had that wisdom, what we call prana, which is a transcendental wisdom of realizing that actually on a deeper level of consciousness, we all interconnected, yeah? And then love arises as a result of that, yeah? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Because it's hard, I think it's hard to understand if we've never been introduced to that. But I, I, th I think to take, maybe to take um, a, an image, it's like little waves on the oceans, yeah? You see these little waves on the oceans, yeah? We are like those little waves, yeah? And we think we, we separate it from everything else. You know, I'm these little waves and I behave in a certain way and I can move in a certain way and things like that. And we completely forget that there's a whole ocean that can, that's connecting everything else together, if you see it. And sometimes when we connect to that depth, if you see it, our consciousness arises. Yeah. And the reason why we start with meditation is because meditation, in a way, uh, we don't do just meditation uh, to relax. We do meditation to reach that transcendental understanding because with meditation, what we start to do, we start to actually feel a mind that is not so conditioned by ourselves. When you reach a deeper state of consciousness in meditation, what you feel is like, actually, I'm not, I'm not just completely in my body anymore. I can feel that I disidentify with my body and with my mind and something sort of arises if you see what I mean. And it's a bit like that in meditation. Sometimes in meditation, we're trying to reach to the depth. Yeah? I'm going to finish with um, some lines of uh, my teacher, Bhante Sangharachita. And that, that, when my name was given to me, uh, I was very surprised when my, my teacher gave me my name. I never, I never thought I would get prana. I never thought I would get wisdom. I thought I'm going to get something like uh, pure, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, or maybe... Uh, what, peace <laughs> uh, but not prania i was like no 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 way but he did uh, and he gave me that reading he didn't write it sangha akshita our teacher the teacher who created founded this movement wrote that and i'm gonna read that to you um, so he says the enlightenment of the buddha was not called detached knowledge he saw with warmth he saw with feelings what is more he saw everything as being pure beauty which also means beautiful. The Buddha saw everything as pure beauty because he saw everything with compassion. Just as, conversely, when you hate someone, they appear ugly. When, out of metta, love, you see things as beautiful, you naturally experience joy and delight. 
And out of that joy and delight flows spontaneity, freedom, creativity, and energy. This flow from metta, love, to joy, to freedom, and energy, it's the constant expanse of the Buddha and the Bodhisattva. The Buddha and the Bodhisattva of wisdom is in the fullest sense, therefore includes metta, love. In a sense, you could even say that love is prana. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, Dharma talk. Uh, so if you did enjoy it, if you're enjoying our videos, I just want to ask you or encourage you to think about making a donation to the Brixton Buddhist community. Uh, we're a UK charity that relies completely on your donations to uh, run everything here. And uh, yeah, if you, this was a class, a meditation class, there'd be a donation bowl that you could just put in £10 at the end of the night uh, to help support the activities. But as you're watching this online, uh, well, I just want to th ask you to think about making an online donation. If you've watched uh, four or five videos this month, uh, maybe you might want to think about giving uh, £10. Uh, so there's a link in the description below where you can go to our website and make a donation. And if you don't want to, if you want to keep giving, you don't want to worry about uh, making that donation every month, well, you could just set us up, up a standing order, a monthly standing order. Uh, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, yeah, I want to suggest something of the region of maybe uh, 10 or £20 pounds a month. Uh, if you're uh, able to do that and that would be really really helpful and help us keep producing videos like this one thanks for listening take care of yourself